<laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tea Talks with Ji Ling, where we share tea conversations and camaraderie with visionary herbalists rippling positive change into their communities by connecting people, plants, and place. I'm Ji Ling, your host, acupuncturist, herbalist, and yoga teacher in Ventura on Herbal Radio, presented by Mountain Rose Herbs. So ahead of time, Happy New Year. We are recording this interview in early September, but we're releasing this interview in January. And Seven Song is, was one of my first herbal mentors and continues to be a dear mentor and inspiration for walking the talk, lifelong learning, and living a life of service. Getting to share this interview with Seven Song feels like a gift. So I hope that you'll enjoy this interview as your New Year's gift. So please make yourself comfortable, pour a cup of your favorite tea, and welcome to today's Tea Talk with Seven Song. Hi, Seven Song. Hey, Jiling. Would you like to introduce yourself or shall I just share your bio? Um, I guess not knowing what's in my bio. <laughs> um, I, I guess I could introduce myself. Okay. Uh, so my name is Seven Song. Um, uh, herbalist of Russian Jewish extraction from downstate New York. And now I've been living in Ithaca, New York for the past 30 something years. And uh, I've been studying plants probably about 20 years, 25 years, hard to say, it all depends on one's definition of studying. Uh, but as much as, as much as I love herbal medicine, I would often, I think of myself as a naturalist and someone just interested in learning uh, lots of different parts of the natural world. And I love categorizing uh, different organisms. So I like knowing which salamander that is and their name or whatever frog or a dragonfly or a spider. Um, and I think, you know, herbal medicine for me marries two important aspects. Uh, one of them is how to do some good while I'm alive. And the other is uh, how to use my my interest in the natural world, um, in this case, plants, since I don't make medicine from animals. Uh, and so I, I, so I think that's enough. Yeah. And Seven Song is also the director and main instructor, of course, at the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine in Ithaca, and is a founding member and clinical herbalist at the Ithaca Free Clinic. And Seven Song, will you share with us some of the plants that right now you're growing, gathering, or processing right now? Uh, well, today I planted, a, a friend Eliza sent me a jujube tree, Zizifus jujube. And so I planted that today in my garden. We'll see how well that does. Um, I'm not that, I mean, I do garden, but it's never been my strongest suit. Uh, gardening is often at the same time that I'm running a school. And so it's hard to do both. Uh, what is interesting? <laughs> uh, I see a lot of goldenrod. Actually, I have to gather goldenrod. So there's lots of goldenrod upstate New York where I live. Uh, that'll be a plant that I'll need to gather and process pretty soon. Uh, I'm looking out my windows right now. Uh, it really, it, I guess it varies. Uh, you know, I, I get more interested in plants and then, all right, so this is, I'll try to uncomplicate this a little bit. So as an herbalist, it's very easy to use the plants that I feel most comfortable with. And as a skeptical person, it's hard for me to often incorporate a new plant into the practice, right? Because how do I, how well do I know how it works? Who does it work for? And so I would say there's a couple of plants that I'm incorporating more in clinical practice at the free clinic. I would say one of them is Stakey's Botanica or Botanica officinalis, wood betony. I'm using a lot more of that as a nervine. Um, I'm using more ceanothus or red root, um, more for a long-term infection. So of course there's around here, we have Lyme as a long-term infection, and then we have the pandemic infection, COVID. So I'd say those are two plants that I'm incorporating more. I'm not gathering either of those more, but they're more a part of my practice. Mm, great. Thank you. And Having been in the world of herbalism for a while now, can you describe just a little bit what your journey towards herbalism like and who inspired you along the way? So let's see. You know, it's hard to since since I've been studying herbs since my mid-20s, 
it's hard to disengage like what is herbal medicine and what is personal growth since they often accompanied each other. Uh, one of my main teachers who was inspired me in the mid nineties was Michael Moore, the herbalist. And he was very important for a couple of reasons. One of them is that he swore a lot. And so I like swear words and I feel like they add oomph to conversations. I know that a lot of people feel uncomfortable around them and I'm careful around kids because, because that's something that, you know, uh, that's a part of our societal norm. Um, so for me though, it was since a lot of my herbal teachers before then just avoided these words and having a teacher that used them regularly and being someone who likes those words, uh, that was really good. So it's a little bit funny to say that, but in fact, it's like a language that I speak and I felt comfortable, but way, way more than that uh, is Michael Moore was very much uh, interested in the science of herbal medicine. And so it was always difficult for me as a very science-minded person and a very skeptical person to, I needed herb teachers that were also skeptical. It's easy to say what works. It's hard to say what doesn't work. And it's hard to, I think it's difficult because herbal medicine is constantly maligned by society. And so it, it, we live in a culture where basically herbal medicine, not, you know, not by everybody, of course, there's, you know, billions of dollars of herbs sold yearly, but by a lot of like leading authorities, it's often like, yeah, maybe you can use herbs, but you know, maybe not, and maybe it'll interfere with the drugs. Those are all like that second part about interfering with drugs is a reasonable thing to consider. But the point I'm trying to, I guess, trying to eventually get to is because we're used to herbs being relegated to a lower kind of medicine that we get defensive when somebody says, maybe this plant doesn't do what we always hear that it does. But Michael Moore was clearer than most to say, maybe Echinacea does this, or maybe OSHA does this. And it's important as healthcare practitioners, which is what an herbalist is, is a healthcare practitioner, to question the substances that we give people um, and try not to get defensive about them. So in other words, yeah, questioning what I use on a regular basis. So Michael Moore was very good at that. Uh, and just a more clinical uh, science-based approach. So. By science-based, there's very little science on herbal medicine, frankly. I mean, you can read there are studies. If you go to PubMed, almost any plant has many of them, but it doesn't have the rigorousness of most conventional medicines. Um, so by science, I just mean really being skeptical and trying to get as much valid information as we can. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I feel like throughout the course of my education with you, I learned to uh, develop that sense of skepticism and ask good questions and... <laughs> Um, be, have a critical mindset, which I have found super valuable. Did you find yourself swearing more? Definitely. <laughs> with relish. Thank you, Seven Song. <laughs> and one of the beauties of studying with Seven Song, uh, I was one of Seven Song's three apprentices uh, during the year where I got to study with him. Um, and in that, also getting to work at the Ithaca Free Clinic. And Seven Song, you were one of the founding members of the Ithaca Free Clinic in 1997. I did a little- Oh, no, 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 Really? 2006. Oh, okay. That's what it said on the website. So 2006, okay. I'm gonna have to change that. Okay, well, congratulations on all these years of being with the Ithaca Free Clinic. Uh, will you tell? Will you share with us what's it like being a clinical herbalist in an integrated free clinic? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So working in the free clinic is probably one of the most proudest accomplishments, aside from students like yourself, Ji Ling, who go on to help so many people. Um, and so in 2005, a number of us got together. So there was already a number of people discussing having a free clinic. Ithaca doesn't have a free clinic. And so there was people from different disciplines uh, getting together. It's interesting. There was a good friend of mine who was at some of these meetings who said, you should come to these meetings. We're starting a free clinic. And frankly, I was just like, there's no way there's going to be an integrated free clinic. I mean, I was just skeptical. Um, and so finally I went to a meeting. I'm like, damn, this is really happening. Like, so there was, you know, people who work, you know, people who are more administration at the hospital, you were lower end administration um, and doctors and a couple of alternative healthcare practitioners. There's about 18 of us. And it took about a year and a half and we got the free clinic going. So it's been running, it, this is its 15th year, the door is open. Uh, we made it through COVID, which of course carried its own set of complications. 
Uh, it's been a fantastic learning experience for me. I feel indebted. I feel grateful, appreciative uh, that I that I happen to live in a town where this happened and I was able to be a part of it. So I've been a part of it and been going, been working there ever since 2006, January of 2006. And uh, it's been a learning experience. It's, it makes me understand our medical system even better because I'm around people who fall through the cracks of the medical system. Uh, and so I've never liked the American medical system. We have a terrible medical system here. Um, it's also allowed me to get a front view seat of it and to seeing more of where, you know, where we fit in, where other groups fit in. I mean, here's a thing by itself. Why is there even a free clinic, right? Why the United States, why do we have to have free clinics? And the answer is because many people can't afford healthcare. So there's a part of it that's more about the medicalization uh, that I'm involved in and understanding that part, like uh, uh, insurance, non-insurance in the US. Uh, another part of it that's been really interesting for me is working with doctors. I've always liked working with good people, really whatever their discipline is. And so at a free clinic, most of the people who work there are very caring, meaning at this point, the doctors, nurse practitioners and nurses. And it gives me access to ask questions that I have. And I have lots of questions about medical world and about different drugs and about, you know, so many of the doctors there have been in practice for 30 or 40 years and just saying, you know, what have you, where have you seen the difficulties or the positive aspects of a certain medication? So just a moment ago, I talked about how I think the United States medical system is terrible. I would not, we have a terrible system, but that's entirely different than the medicine itself. And often many of the people involved in giving medical care, by this I mean doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, you know, what, what I tend to call conventional healthcare. And uh, there's a lot offered there and I've just learned much more, you know, as somebody who's concerned about my patients who are taking medication, like be able to have somebody who's monitoring them that's close by and that I have a relationship with uh, is extremely helpful. So, so far what I've said is like, front view seat of like watching uh, the medical system, uh, also being able to work with medical people who are concerned uh, and are offering their help for free. All, all medical staff at the free clinic is, is our volunteers. There is some administration. Um, another thing is just seeing what a free clinic looks like, you know, and being a part of it and, you know, be, just, you know, going around one day, spending time with the executive produce, the executive uh, director, Another time spending a lot of time with the clinic coordinator and just like learning, what is a free clinic like? One thing, you know, it's funny, often people will ask me about like my free clinic because I talk about it. It is so much not my free clinic. Like all these people, what I'm talking to, like I have, I can never do their job. I can never open a free clinic that was anything like this. Like I have done free medicine where I bring medicines and sit down someplace and treat people. That's easy. But all the legality, all the administration, all the interface with the other parts of the medical world, getting volunteers, like that's just way beyond anything that I can do. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then one more thing is that I practicing. So as somebody who wants to know how well herbal medicine works in, in our current environment, so how does herbal medicine work here and now in the US, I've had a lot of opportunity to give a lot of people free herbs, you know, so thousands of people over the past 15 years, giving herbs, seeing what works, seeing, like working on my skills about being a practitioner in this environment and how much that's important, uh, learning you know, who's gonna take herbs and what forms of herbs to administer, um, getting much better at assessment and diagnosis. It's been phenomenal. And then also bringing people like you and Nishan uh, to the clinic. So, you know, having apprentices who work with me who come to the clinic and expose them and so that they can go out and have a better, uh, have better skills at working with people. Yeah, really incredible learning experience and a really incredible service-based experience as well. And I, I wonder what are some of the challenges, if any, that you face with being at the free clinic? Like what's difficult so there's some logistical challenges. Um, I, the people I work with are very supportive. I, I, this is so often when people ask me like about working in a free clinic, one of the ways that, this is a little bit off your question, then I'll come back to the challenges. One of the ways I think though that has worked for me is I speak a medicalese language. Like I like medical terminology. I don't like 
I don't like reducing people to their medical pieces. Like I, I'm not into depersonalization. So I, nothing about that. But often like I'm thinking like, do they have inflammation here? Do they have, you know, in other words, I like I, sometimes understanding a pathology along with their constitution uh, is very helpful. I guess though my point there is I think a lot of the doctors feel comfortable because I speak a language that's familiar with them. Um, so, and I do it for myself, not for them. So that's allowed me to be, to make other people that I work with feel comfortable that there's an, herb, there's an herbalist in the free clinic. There's actually two herbalists. Uh, Cal also works at, at the free clinic. Well, so, and then I just said this, just really this physical and financial challenges. So since this is a Mountain Rose podcast, I want to say that Mountain Rose, shout out to Mountain Rose and a shout out to Mason as he's leaving the Mountain Rose door, uh, have been very supportive. And the only reason I'm saying this is because it's true. Um, because one of the logistical problems is just financial. So I'm going to go into that. But I just want to, I do want to spend this moment and just saying it's just honest for me is Mountain Rose has been very supportive of me as an herbalist in the free clinic and has allowed me to treat a lot more people with a lot more medicine or just a lot more medicine. And so thank you, Mountain Rose. And um, so logistics are just, there's a couple of them first. So I paid for the medicines that are not donated, right? And so even when Mountain Rose donates medicines and other people as well donate medicines, we still have to make the medicines out of the raw herbs since not that many people want tea. So it's just, it's expensive. So I, I basically do this by running an herb school. You mentioned the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine. And so I make money from being a teacher and I use that money to, uh, to buy herbs and make herbal medicines to bring to the clinic. So there's a financial aspect to it uh, that'd be, that's difficult. The other thing is just storage. It's just, you know, herbal medicine is big medicine. Like this, we don't have these little bottles of pills. We have, you know, drawers of lots of herbs and big bottles of tinctures and basins of alcohol. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a voluminous medicine. And so the other day we got, you would love it, Julie. We just got these new drawers. So we don't no longer have those boxes on top of each other that were always wow. risky, right? We've, we've had that ever since you've been here. Um, and so I just, I got somebody to give me a donation and I spent it on cabinetry. And so we have these beautiful homemade drawers that pull out uh, to get the herbs in. And also for people who are less tall than me, uh, I'm six foot tall, right? Uh, it's easier to get the med. It's really, it's beautiful. I can send photos. Um, but the problem with that is all of a sudden then we had all this stuff that we couldn't have at the clinic and that means back to my home and it's just like so my house is just you know half of my home is storage of herbal medicines oh. so those are logistical that's it's a real logistical problem at this point it's reasonable i would probably get even more donations if i could but keep where to put them could be problematic um yeah. So for folks who are considering or having ideas about wanting to create accessible herbalism and be part of a free clinic, it sounds like joining somebody else's existing project would be the way to go as opposed to starting up your own free clinic, herbal free clinic. Yeah. What I would really suggest is being in on the ground floor. That's the thing that's really changed it for me. So I didn't join the free clinic. I've always been, I mean, I'm a founding member. So founding member just means one of many people that helped it. But, you know, I went to lots of meetings, people, we all knew each other. And so I'm kind of integrated in an integrative clinic. Uh, so I just want to point out that the free clinic does have conventional medicine. There's doctors, nurse practitioners. We don't have medications. We just have a few medications. The, uh, so when people need them, we still have to write, you know, the doctors write a prescription. Sometimes we're able to get discounts for people. Um, but we have nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, physician assistants, uh, as well as uh, we have acupuncturists, chiropractor, occupational therapy. So we have a pretty good smorgasbord of different, uh, different kinds of healthcare practitioners. Yeah. Uh, I lost my within, within the palette of folks who you just presented, what is the role and function of the clinical herbalist? How do we play into the picture? So, so about since about two years ago, we started doing a chronic care program. And in the chronic care program, um, it's me, it's the herbalist, it's anybody who wants to join. 
but it's usually not medical doctors. So there's a nurse practitioner, there's an, an RN nurse, diabetic specialist, um, sometimes the occupational therapy. All right. So before COVID, about once a month, we would get together and discuss the patients that we saw. And then we would discuss amongst us, like what do we think would be the best alternatives for each person? So the role of the clinical herbalist in this situation is often to, is a few things. So sometimes patients come to the clinic and don't want medications. And so the doctors will sometimes refer them to us if they will take herbal medicine. So that's one role of it. Often we augment the medications. So a classic one, we have a lot of folks with diabetes. And so they're taking the metformin or insulin analogs. They're taking the medications, uh, but they're not, you know, the only will work to only reduce the number so much. And so then we'll give them herbs as well. Um, so some of the people I see, see other practitioners. Some of the people I see only want to see the herbalist and have a very, have had so many negative, re negative reactions with um, conventional medicine that they just don't want to be a part of it unless they have to be. Another role for me though, is sometimes listening to people and realizing, trying to help them maybe get more medical attention if that's what they need. Like, so they've had, you know, so the medical system is can be very depersonalizing, right? So it's not hundred percent, but often people go there, it's very expensive. They often leave and feel like, oh, I don't wanna be a part of this again. So they'll come to see me, except sometimes, you know, we'll do an A1C at the clinic and the numbers, you know, they have the numbers like 10.3 and that's, that's long-term problem. And so, you know, one of my goals might be to say, if you're comfortable, can I help, can you work with one of the dietitians or diabetic? Diabetic counselors here, um, and you know you might need drugs might be important here. If somebody has Lyme, I might be suggesting that they get antibiotics. I, I don't write those prescriptions, of course. Yeah. So, uh, okay. just to use the word. Uh, so sometimes I consider myself a medical bridge. Basically, I think about helping people understand that you know again, like the people I work with are pretty are pretty friendly, and you know they have more time with their doctor here than they would have in a normal the doctor's visit. And so that makes people feel more comfortable. Mm, yeah. So partially offering alternative options for folks who have taken a bunch of medications and it's not serving them or just don't want to take medications. So on one side doing that and on the other side being that medical bridge and providing referrals as needed and being able to listen to and speak medical ease and help normal people out. That, that's correct. So I think one thing that's a little different than my practice and some other herbal practices is that a majority of the people I've seen have never seen an herbalist before. So a part of it is how do I make them feel comfortable? Like what language can I use to make them feel comfortable? Uh, you know, so I, you know, I have long hair, so that might, you know, make feel a little bit awkward, you know, so I might not fit the full description, but there's ways that, you know, our body language, our language language, um, is how to make people feel more comfortable to understand that, you know, herbal medicine is just another form of medicine mm -hmm. and how that might fit into their life. Yeah. Thank you, Seven Song. Well, you mentioned sourcing a lot of the herbs for the free clinic from Mountain Rose, who's been super generous and continues to be really generous with the Ithaca free clinic. But you also source quite a few herbs from wildcrafting. And will you tell us a little bit about your relationship with wildcrafting and why you feel like wildcrafting is still important and how that plays into your clinical and educational and personal practices? So... You know, so there's the thing, you know, I really like plants. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, there's an expression that green, uh, uh, forget the expression. I really like plants and I really, I like to be around them. I like to key them out. I'm a botanist, I'm a self-taught botanist. And so, you know, when I have free time, I like to go out and find new plants and identify them and, you know, technical botanical keys. Um, and I like to make medicine. I have to say, as I've gotten older and my back has gotten older with the rest of me, you know, sometimes I'm really glad to have uh, younger people or people with better backs uh, <laughs> help out because it's a lot of physical labor, uh, but I still like it. Uh, we're going to West Virginia in a few days. And while we're down there, I'll probably gather some hydrangea root, uh, which is a, just an excellent diuretic for a BPH and UTIs, but BPH maybe more specifically. 
I'll do, see if I can find some Ceanothus americanus and make some medicine for that uh, as something for chronic long-term infections. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, so I've been wildcrafting. So there's, so I've been gathering plants for medicine since I've been in my mid twenties and all around the U.S. You know, not everywhere, but not everywhere. Partly because of environmental concerns and you know pollution concerns. But as far as regions, I've really, I've been, I feel really fortunate. I've been able to just look at plants all around the country and then gather some. So wild crafting is still relevant, uh, though we have to be, we've always had to be cautious about not harming the environment. So we just can't willy nilly wildcraft, right? Because plants play a very important ecological role where they grow. And so if we start just taking plants without considering the whole environment that we're taking them from, uh, we can damage. And certainly one of my goals in life is to not do that much damage. So it's, it's a lot of ecological, environmental, ethical, considerations while wildcrafting, but I still really enjoy it. I mean, there are plants that are very common. There's lots of weedy plants that we can gather, but anybody who's gonna wildcraft, the first thing you have to do is you have to learn how to first identify the plant properly. And next you have to scout, right? So if you go to a new region, like around here, I've lived in Ithaca for 30 years. So I have a pretty good idea in this region, what plants are gatherable and what aren't. But if I go to a new region, I have no idea. Like, is there enough Arnica in this area? Is there enough particularis? So if somebody's going to wildcraft, they have to make sure that they do an extensive, you know, uh, what's the word for it? They'd have to, you know, roam an area extensively to make sure that, you know, you're not just, you know, that this pocket of particularis is only one pocket and no more around it. You want to make sure that the area is flush with it so that you're not doing damage uh, to it. And so I think that, you know, some people say that, growing herbs and the wildcrafting herbs have, might have different medicinal properties. They might, but that's not the reason for it. I just really enjoy being out in nature uh, and gathering uh, plant medicines. Mm -hmm. So the importance comes in the, the role of bringing people and herbalists in connection with the plants that they're gathering and this relationship with place as well. I think so, at least for me, I mean, that's the problem, right? Is that I do have students and we do talk about wildcrafting. I'm always hoping nobody comes like the rogue, horrible wildcrafter. And yeah. there's really no way to stop that. But hopefully throughout the course, uh, I instill enough awareness uh, for people not to do that. I think it'd be uncommon, frankly. I think a lot of the, most of the students I have here are pretty considerate. The problem is if you really want to plant and there's not much of it, that's where it gets tricky, right? So yeah. you're thinking, I really need this thing. And this is the first stand I see and it's raining or it's snowing or I'm hungry. And so you have to push past that and make sure that it is ecologically uh, tenable to gather from an area. So with the herbal medicines that you uh, give to people at the free clinic, what percentages would you say are purchased, donated, wildcrafted or other, other ways of procuring herbal medicine? So the majority of medicines we give people are tinctures because they're the easiest, uh, just to, just easy to take and they're easy to store. Um, I would say 65 to 70% wildcrafted, maybe 60% wildcrafted, almost none are purchased. Maybe 5% are purchased. I, I, frankly, I, that would be out of my range of being able to, to purchase herbs. I mean, the thing I have to purchase is the menstruums, alcohol and and the tools to make the medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, I would guess 60, 65% wildcrafted, 20 or so percent uh, donated, maybe 25 to 30%, and then 10% are just leaving out of the equation. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. That is a lot of wildcrafted medicine. Yeah, it's not just me. It's, it's the apprentices that are here, like yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely get help with wildcrafting. Yeah, wow. Seven song... Why is herbal medicine important in our contemporary world? <laughs> I think about this a lot. And sometimes in places I go to, since I, you know, I kind of, I work in a more conventional setting, uh, people often ask, like, why bother with herbal medicine? I think that's a great question. I think, I think avoiding that question is avoid, you know, I think just, well, embracing that question allows one to really think, like, why is herbal medicine helpful in this day and age? Because there are many medicines that are really work very well, you know? So, 
So there's a number of reasons, but the main reason is choice for me. So every time we cut off a form of medicine, so whether it's acupuncture or herbal medicine or, or uh, I don't know, some kind of physical Reiki. Reiki. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't going to say it. So, um, but every time we cut off something, we just cut off an avenue where something further can be developed. So if you think about it differently, right? So what happened if herbal medicine was not condoned by, was not put down by the Flexner Report in 1910, right? So the Flexner Report is very complicated and really did a lot of damage, maybe a few good things, but a lot of damage. But one of the things it basically did is shut down er all the herbal schools. What if that didn't happen? That would mean that since let's say 18, 1910, there would have been like 50 or 60 years where it would have been very active. So herbal medicine has always thrived. Like it's just like, it just didn't thrive in kind of mainstream medicine, but after, outside the mainstream herbal medicine has always been alive. And so, and culturally, uh, you know, just being culturally used by different groups of people, just again, mainstream less so. So I think like what happens if those herb schools did well and kind of maintain their integrity, we would have like all these years where herbal medicine and science were going at the same rate. There'd be all these excellent studies. We'd have so much better information, but that's not what happened. So basically it's been pushed aside. And so there's like the scruffy bunch of people, right? And others, less scruffy people who have been, you know, using it. So, I mean, it's a tricky thing because if herbal medicine had stayed the path of conventional medicine, it would probably be like in some European countries where it's very heavily bottled and very heavily restricted. And there's not these freewheeling herb schools like my own, there'd be, you know, just, you know, you know, state owned or state regulated schools. So it's tricky. So number one is choice. Uh, number two is lots of plants uh, augment uh, many medicines. There's lots of people I know on multiple medications. So this is tricky and this is a very big subject for another time maybe. But a lot of the people I know have been on, whether it's their anxiolytics, their, um, their uh, antidepressants, or their uh, sugar regulating drugs or hormone regulating drugs. And then you, give, you put herbs into the equation and sometimes it really uh, helps the effect, like the synergy of those two things can work really well. Mm -hmm. Next, is herbal medicine is you could make it yourself. So most people cannot, right? So it's it's hard to make, as I said, it could be backbreaking. You know, if you have physical debility, disability, uh, making your own herbal medicine not really, can, might, not, might not be an option. Or if you just work a lot, right? So you have three jobs trying to, or two jobs or one job and just, you know, trying to keep ends meeting, that also is gonna make it difficult. But for some of us, we, we can put it into a part of our lives and we can then gather plants and not be a part of the system and offer it to people um, and keep it less expensive potentially. So I think there's choice. I think there's augmentation. I think that there's places where herbal medicine is a primary medicine. There's just some, there are so many first aid incidences that herbal medicine just works very well. So for like burns, you have things like lavender essential oil or aloe vera or cacti. But there's just this whole range. And you know, right away now we go to the medicine cabinet. So why not just get medicines? I don't, there's a sense of autonomy that comes from knowing that you have the resources, you have the skill, or just basic knowledge of knowing that you could, you know, use onions and it'll be very slightly helpful for a cold or a flu, for instance. And so I think the modern medical system really de-autonomizes us. It just it doesn't allow autonomy. And I think that people feeling like they have, they have a stake in their own health and they have some skills. Uh, well, it's not gonna be cure disease. It certainly might be uplifting enough for some people. Uh, those are some of them. Uh, I also just think plants are beautiful. And I think, I don't really know how that fits in, uh, but I like it because it's just, um, yeah, it's just nice to take something. Personally, I like the idea that I can make some of my own medicines. Are these some of the reasons why you have been running the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine for 25 years? <laughs> I think so. You know, why we do things is a hard, like, you know, <laughs> I started doing it and I've just kept doing it. Um, but I like teaching. And so, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a little mixed, right? I like, you know, I like teaching. And so, and I feel, you know, I only want to teach things that I feel I have some skill or some comfort level in. 
And so herbal medicine would be there. But it, it is extremely, any teacher out here, any, every teacher listening to this knows that one of the most gratifying things ever is seeing your students take what, you, what you've taught them and convert it to their own and reach out with whatever that product is, even if it's entirely different than what you taught them, but feel like you were a part of that person's journey uh, to helping themselves and helping others. That's, that's like the most gratifying thing. Yeah, well, with all these years of running the school and working on the clinic, you've definitely touched the lives of many Seven Song and thanks for being a huge part of my journey. And now coming up on the 25th year of your school, what's next? What's coming up next for you? Um, <laughs> age, age is age. coming up hard and fast. Yeah. So I'm 63. Uh, I'll still be 63 in January when you hear this. And so I'm starting to think like, what haven't I done? I think I'm having the same thoughts of lots of people. So while this body is reasonably healthy, um, I want to, so there's nothing about the school. This is entirely about me. This is what I've been thinking. Like I've never been to this, to the, uh, to the Badlands of South Dakota. I've never been to the Black Hills. Uh, I'd love to go there. I'd love to see the plants there. I'm not so interested in wildcrafting. I just want to see the plants of areas that I know very little about. So that's one of them. As far as like professional, I want to go to Australia. Uh, as far as professionalism, I guess I'm just going to follow the easy move and start to take some more of my classes online uh, because it, it takes less energy. I mean, at this point, if it's hard. Like having run an in-person school for 25 years and just last year starting to do some of my classes online, I, I understand the benefit of it, reaching many more people, um, being able to lower the price, maybe making it much easier that people don't have to move to Ithaca or travel to Ithaca on a regular basis. Um, all of that, you know, just making it more accommodatable for so many people. But it's entirely different the, the community that forms with an in-person school is not a community that forms online. And so that's one of the hardest things. Also, I like getting to know the people, right? So, you know, I, in my life of running the school for so long, I've just met a lot of people and some of them I've been good friends with. I mean, definitely like the person visiting me today is a former apprentice of, I don't know, maybe from 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've watched them do excellent work and it's just been really proud of them of watching you, Ji Ling. Mm -hmm. uh, to reach out more. Um, so that is something I would very much miss. But I'm realizing that, you know, as far as energy levels, at one point, you know, I'm going to be moving stuff online. The free clinic, I'm just going to keep doing that as long as possible, uh, which could be for a very long period of time. As mm -hmm. long as so far, the clinic is doing well. Uh, so I hope to, I, I like treating people. I, I, I just really, again, uh, using the word gratification. Uh, giving people herbs, having them come back, even if it doesn't work and they're honest and we try other herbs and hopefully find something. Uh, I had a patient the other day coming, this is a little, this is a little off topic. Maybe <laughs> uh, I had a patient <laughs> come in and he just had, she was on a lot of medications and she was having a lot of difficulty sleeping and she wanted to try herbs. I'm saying, you know, so I don't want to go into any details, but I'll, I have to say, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know, like these medications don't help because they were very strong. I don't know if herbs will help. In fact, she was able to start taking the herbs. So this doesn't always happen, but it's just one of these things that's revivifying for me. Uh, basically, she started taking herbs and still takes herbs and got off some of these pretty hardcore medications. Wow. So I want to be a part of that. Like I want to help people and I want to continue to learn. I mean, I'm just, you know, like so many, I'm just a novice really uh, mm -hmm. without learning about herbal medicines because we don't have a good collection of data to go on. We have a lot of old books, but it's hard to figure out what's really legitimate. Mm, yeah. So it sounds like a lot of beautiful possibilities are coming up on the horizon, school coming online, doing a bit of travel and continuing to run the your portion of the Ithaca Free Clinic and becoming one of the prized ancient herbalists. <laughs> <laughs> That, oh, yeah. that is my goal. <laughs> That's exactly my goal. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm just imagining your, your journey from 20 year old. Uh, there's a there's a photo of seven song that I saw. I think you showed it to us seven song of yourself half naked teaching at the G Gesundheit Institute going from there to to now wait, wait, wait. I'm wearing I'm wearing an apron, just an apron, <laughs> just an apron. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so going from from that place of young hippie with flowers in your hair to to now considering what how do you transition uh, how do you transition your school and how do you transition your work as your body is changing? Uh, and what an amazing journey. And thank you for sharing all that with us. Sure. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's yeah. fun to do this. Fun to see you, Jiling. <laughs> yeah. Well, any final words that you would like to share with our audience or are there top books, top herbal book recommendations that you would like to share? Well, I, I really like Jillian Stansberry's new books. So as far as clinical, as far as if, like if, if you're practicing and you want to step up your clinical skills and have a book, I think Jillian's books or Jill, Jillian Stansberry's are really good. There's a lot of good books out there. That's just one that I'm looking at currently. No, I, I think, well, one thing I think is that if you have, if you have an opportunity to go to an in-person or I'm not recommending my school, uh, a little bit, I guess, recommending my school, but I'm recommending wherever you live, like it. If you have if you have the time and money to go to an herb school, um, I would suggest that if you can do it in person before, like a lot of them are going to go online, is my guess, and it's really just a different experience. I mean, that's so I'm saying that partially from personal experience. My first herb school was the Platonic Academy of Herbal Studies, <laughs> Santa Cruz, California, in 1981. Wow. My second herb school was the California School of Herbal Studies in 1983, and then Michael Moore in Albuquerque, 94 and 95. But those, I still have friends from those schools, well, from Michael Moore's school, uh, but the experience there and the experience I see from my students networking with each other uh, really matters a lot. I mean, I imagine it's in almost any discipline, but uh, since this is an herbal broadcast, I would say as a, if you have an opportunity to network with people and start making those connections because you're gonna have questions, right? Because all of a sudden you're gonna see somebody with a illness that you've never seen or a characteristic part of the illness you haven't seen. And then if you know people that you feel comfortable with, you can ask them questions, makes it very, the networking is really important. It's also networking is just an important part of life, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. we're human, human animals. <laughs> yes, that, and social ones, even people who tend to isolate like myself. <laughs> um, also, I guess just to say, if you, I write a lot of stuff on social media, um, so my name is Seven Song on on Facebook. It's just spelled out S E V E N S O N G, um, and then I Instagram something like that as well. Um, so if you want, I tend to post a lot because I'm a blabbermouth. And I like <laughs> blabber fingers, I guess, as well. Yeah, and I'll have those links in the in the show notes. And uh, Seven Song also posts really beautiful photographs, which is how I originally came to find Seven Song was with a gorgeous photo of a Luna moth. And speaking <laughs> of photos of somebody, I have that great photo. If you go to my website, yeah. uh, one of the like banner photos on the top is going to be Ji Ling holding up a, a lotus root, a big lotus rhizome. It's a really it's a beautiful photo. So if you it go is. there. Uh, you, you'll you'll see that G link photo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining us, Seven Song. Thank you, G link. Yeah, and everyone, thank you so much for listening to Tea Talks with G Ling on Herbal Radio. If you'd like to reach out, then send me an email at lingjiling at gmail.com or find me on my website at jilinglin.com. And Seven Song is easily accessible at sevensong.com. Until next time, happy herbal adventures. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>